Reported by Bukhari and Muslim, the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, that he said, I heard Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi say, Islam is built on five. Islam has five pillars. Testify to the oneness of Allah and the prophethood of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi and fasting the month of Ramadan. And this matter, the five pillars we've heard since we were able to understand words from <laughs> our parents since we were children. We were always taught the five pillars of Islam. And as mentioned before, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, obviously, these five pillars, they are <laughs> the fundamentals of our religion. Therefore, made obligatory on every single believer. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the hadith Qudsi, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَبْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ And the servant wouldn't get close to me except doing that which I made obligatory upon him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves these main acts so much that he's made them the pillars of our religion. When in battle, when there's a war, and you've got the general, or if the king, or the, the leader of the Muslims, or the leader of a nation, joins the war along with the most important people who are needed for the people they would stand stand behind yeah there would be an organized approach to how to defend the army and who would be the front line and then behind them and then behind them and then all the important people at the back the very back protected by these different layers, different people, barricaded. So the enemies, if they get through the front line, they will get to the second line. But if they get through the second line, they're still the third line. If they get through the third line, they're still the fourth line. And then by the time they get into the heart of the army, they're surrounded and they'll be ambushed. So they can never get to the generals and the most important and protected people of the army. With the obligations, this is how we should treat it. Barricade the obligations far behind, so when the shayateen and desires come to attack, they can never get anywhere close. What do you mean by this in practical sense? Test that uh, testifying to Allah Azza wa Jal, the first one, is such an important matter. La ilaha illallah, the oneness of Allah. If put on the scale, as Rasulullah mentions, and the heavens and the earth and everything within them put on the other side, La ilaha illallah would outweigh it all in its entirety. So indeed it is the 
biggest blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted all of us, alhamdulillah. The prayer after was so important that it had to be given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by Allah azza wa jal with no one in between. Above the seven heavens. And it's being so crucial, the five daily prayers. There is no excuse for anyone as long as they are mentally stable. The other pillars afterwards, they have conditions. If those conditions can't be met, they are dropped. But Salah is never dropped. And so being this crucial, this important, those specific raka'ats of fard, obligatory prayers should be the main protected deeds. The two for Fajr, four for Dhuhr, Asr, three for Maghrib and four for Isha. These are the obligatory prayers. Obligated upon us by Allah Azza wa Jalla, by our Lord, what we owe Him. And this is the reason, the hikmah behind the Sunnah acting as the line right in front of the obligatory prayers. So it's vital and crucial that we keep up the Sunan al rawatib the 10 or 12 raka'ats, the two with Fajr, six with Dhuhr, two with Maghrib and two with Isha. They act as the first line after the obligatory prayers. So the shayateen can't attack the obligatory prayers directly. They have to get through the sunan first. And then, salah being this important, and us, inshallah, trying our best to attain the closeness of Allah and His love, we, we ought to try to pray more nawafil. The duha prayer, the prayer between the salah and uh, the, the, the adhan and the iqamah, and the other nawafin that would act as the lines in front of the sunnah to protect the obligatory prayers because it's so vital and it's what we owe our Lord Azza wa Jal. And on top of that, on Yawm al Qiyamah, as mentioned, if there are deficiencies in the salah, every other deed would be deficient. And sometimes we are human beings. We can't pray every single rakah, especially in our time, 100% as expected from us. And so from the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal, this sunan and these nawafil would be put on the scale and added to the brief repairs to make up for the deficient ones. And this is the rahmah of mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. The psalm of Ramadan, That should be behind the obligatory, that's the obligatory act. And then we have the, the fast of um, the Ayyamul Bib, the three days in the month, Monday and Thursday. And what's more recommended usually is those few weeks before Ramadan. Why? Because when we get to Ramadan, we already have an organized army in place. So the obligatory is kept safe and we already have layers. We have uh, lines ready if the shayateen attack. For the zakah, annual zakah of 2.5% for the wealth we do not touch in that full year over a certain amount. really for us especially going through these difficult times and witnessing what our brothers and sisters are going through we should have weekly or monthly direct debates standing orders sadaqat doesn't have to be a lot even one pound 50p two pounds but consistently ahabbu al-a'mali ila allah adwamuha wa inqal the most beloved action to Allah are the consistent ones 
even the if, even if they're little. If you carry on paying 20p per week for the rest of your life, wallahi is better than a thousand pounds right now and never again. And those act as those lines so shaitan cannot get through and attack the actual pillar, the actual obligation of zakat. And the hajj, the once in a lifetime obligation, we should try our best to not delay it. As soon as we meet the condition of health and wealth, it is not allowed for a believer. We take this one, this pillar for granted. We don't really give it it's, uh, it's due right, especially in our culture. We leave until we're past 50, 60, as they say back home in my country, especially, let me do everything I want in life. Then when I'm 50, 60, I'll go Hajj. I mentioned a few months ago, uh, speaking to families, relatives in my country back home. So they said, uh, are you going to Hajj? I said, well, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows me, now, why would you go Hajj? Why well, you're in your 20s? Who goes in Hajj when in their 20s? At least wait until you like your dad's age. Or even older than that. Even that's young. <laughs> like your dad's age, even that's young. But at least that, 40, 50, 60, then you should go. When in actual reality, if you meet the condition of health and wealth, it's not allowed for you to delay it. And you shouldn't delay it. And if it's not possible at all to go Hajj, and if you've never been before to Medina and Mecca, just to motivate you to eventually go and fulfill that fifth <coughs> pillar of Islam, try your best to go for our Umrah. Wallahi, I promise you, my brothers, that love for Medina and Mecca would only would only show itself in your heart when you visited that one time. Once you visit it once, then you always want to go again. I remember the the first time the first time I went a couple of years ago. I went to Medina, um, and we were with a few brothers. We went to Medina. Uh, we couldn't sleep. We couldn't sleep the whole night. We just wanted to go to the Haram. And when we went to Mecca, Alhamdulillah, we did our Umrah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all our worship. We were there for about six, seven days. So at the end of those six, seven days, that week, we went on top of the uh, second, third floor of uh, Masjid Al Haram to look down on Kaaba. You know where they have the. Uh, the mataf up there for, for the, the elderly, the ones with wheelchairs and everything. The long one, the second, third floor. So we were there on the roof looking down on the Kaaba and we knew it's the last time we're going to see it. It may be the last time, you never know if we're going to see the Kaaba again. So we were four or five of us brothers looking down on the Kaaba and we knew we were going to leave. We just stood there for hours and we couldn't leave. It was so difficult. The brothers start tearing up, they start weeping. And we didn't think it would be this difficult. Then we left, finally left, the brothers say, no, I'm going to go back. I want to see you again. So he went back and he's weeping, he's tearing up. So that would serve as the front lines and protect this pillar from the influences of shaitan and our desires. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us on the straight path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to reach Medina and Mecca again after the coronavirus and the virus and this, the current situation uh, resolves itself. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all our worship. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to keep steadfast His religion. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to meet Him while we pure and with pure hearts. Barakallahu feekum. Wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.